What's up, all my purple bears out there? Professor Hurley bringing you back to another episode of Purple Bear Biology. If you haven't caught our last few episodes, we've been discussing the endocrine system. You should definitely pause here and take a look at the first couple of videos into the endocrine system so you'll have a more well-rounded understanding of the system as a whole. In this part of the endocrine series, we are going to delve into a very important part of the hormonal regulation associated primarily with our ability to reabsorb water before peeing it out as urine, and how our body responds to stress in both the short-term and long-term stress scenario. In this episode, we are going to be discussing hormone and effect relationships of the adrenal gland and kidney. You may or may not remember our conversation about the adrenal gland when we discussed the sympathetic nervous system's ability to stimulate a fight or flight response with neurohormones called epinephrine and norepinephrine. The adrenal gland is located at the top of both of our kidneys and could be divided into a superficial section called the adrenal cortex and a deep portion called the adrenal medulla. The medulla is what can be stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system to release epinephrine into the bloodstream. But the cortex plays a vital role in blood osmotic concentration homeostasis, as well as modulating our body's response to long-term stress factors. The adrenal cortex releases aldosterone for water retention, cortisol for stress response, and androgens to synthesize sex hormones like testosterone and the active form of estrogen referred to as estradiol. We are going to discuss each of these hormones effects in detail, so let's begin with the cortex. Let's kick this off with aldosterone. When you think of aldosterone, the first thing that should pop into your mind is water retention because ultimately this is one of the primary functions of this hormone. To understand this pathway, first realize that there are actually a couple ways to stimulate aldosterone to be released from the adrenal cortex. The most direct way is the adrenal cortex has receptors on select cells that can detect concentrations of blood, sodium, potassium, or hydrogen ions. Humoral changes like these can cause aldosterone to be released from the adrenal cortex, but a more familiar pathway can also be involved. While not the most prominent pathway for aldosterone releasal are good old friends the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland can stimulate its release too. The hypothalamus is actually monitoring blood osmolarity with specialized receptors called osmoreceptors that can detect minute changes in osmotic pressure in the blood. If a deviation from osmotic homeostasis is detected, the hypothalamus responds by releasing corticotropin releasing hormone to the anterior pituitary gland. The pituitary gland responds by releasing adrenocorticotropic hormone, aka ACTH to travel to the adrenal cortex. Once ACTH binds with cortex receptors, this results in aldosterone being released into the blood. Okay, so now that we know how aldosterone can be stimulated for releasal, how does it cause our bodies to retain water? Well, the answer to that question is actually quite cool. While we haven't discussed kidney structure, we will later this year. So let's start by simplifying our kidney down to just two simple tubes running side by side. On this side we have our blood and on this side we have a fluid called filtrate that will eventually become urine running through a tube called the kidney tubule. Further up this tube pathway, what I have not shown you is that there's actually a filtration system that enables products like ions and other assorted waste to leave the blood and enter this filtrate in the kidney tubule. When this happens, water is osmotically pulled with these products into the filtrate as well. This results in a net loss of water to what will become urine. While this happens all the time and is necessary, if our body notices a change in overall osmotic pressure, then it can use hormones like aldosterone to influence the system. The effect of aldosterone is quite simply awesome. When aldosterone binds to the cell's receptors, sodium and chloride ions are pumped from the filtrate back into the blood. And as a result, water osmotically follows. Aldosterone also has other cool influential effects, including the ability to pump potassium ions from the blood into the kidney tubule. 
And then last, but definitely not least, the effect of aldosterone is a net loss of free hydrogen ions from the blood to the urine. Now don't go forgetting that the number of free hydrogen ions is actually one of the primary determinants of the pH of our blood. So losing them into the urine will result in a rise in our blood pH, making it more alkaline. Isn't that cool? This means that aldosterone not only manipulates water through osmotic concentrations, but is able to help the body regulate its acid-base balance. Now technically there's much more to the story because the kidneys play a pretty important role in aldosterone releasal as well. We will come back to this system later, but for now, let's just focus on the fact that when the body needs to increase blood pressure, it can do that by increasing blood volume. This means adding more water to the blood. To begin this system, the kidney will need to release a hormone called renin that sets off a chemical cascade of reactions, eventually resulting in aldosterone being released from the adrenal cortex to increase water retention. This process is super cool, but we'll just have to wait until we get to the kidney to continue the conversation. As I'm sure you can imagine, everything we're discussing is when the body is behaving normally. But what about when it behaves abnormally? Kahn syndrome is a condition in which aldosterone levels are hyper elevated. This leads to a plethora of problems, including too much sodium in the blood, too much potassium getting peed out, and the excess water that is retained with the sodium increases blood volume, dramatically increasing blood pressure. Of course, the opposite could also happen. When aldosterone levels plummet, or the body does not respond correctly to the hormone, the resulting disease can be life-threatening if not treated. As you can imagine, these patients struggle with water and sodium loss through the urine. Technically speaking, we are discussing something called Addison's disease, and aldosterone is not the only hormone affected by the adrenal cortex not working correctly. Concentrations of a hormone called cortisol will also decrease with Addison's disease. Now you may be wondering, wait, what is cortisol? Well, I am glad you asked. When our body becomes stressed, the hypothalamus communicates with the pituitary using the same pathway we just discussed to release aldosterone. In fact, the hormone pathway that we discussed from the hypothalamus to the pituitary is the primary controller of cortisol releasal from the adrenal cortex. Interestingly though, Epinephrine and norepinephrine released in a sympathetic fight or flight response can also result in a release of cortisol. Regardless of the stimuli, the ultimate end goal of cortisol is to enable cells throughout the body to access nutrients during prolonged stressful situations. These energy sources come from all sorts of tissues, but one of the major ones is the liver. In response to cortisol stimulation, the liver will begin to go through a process called gluconeogenesis, where select amino acids, lactate, and or fatty acids can be used to create glucose molecules for energy. In addition to stimulating the production of energy molecules, Cortisol actually acts as a suppressant for inflammation and our immune system. If you've ever used hydrocortisone cream for a rash or a bug bite, you've basically used a synthetic form of this glucocorticoid to reduce inflammation. Some individuals even use synthetic cortisol supplements to help suppress autoimmune disorders where their own immune system has begun to attack their cells. Now, Again, everything we just described there is assuming that cortisol levels are regulated and effective. However, we already know that Addison's disease is caused by a shortage of aldosterone and cortisol. Additionally, cortisol levels can be on the opposite end of the spectrum and be really high as well. A condition known as Cushing's syndrome can result from elevated cortisol levels over a prolonged period of time. Remarkably, about 90% of all of these cases of Cushing's are iatrogenic, meaning that they were actually caused by a medication prescribed by a doctor. Now, you may be wondering, why in the world doctors would be causing Cushing's syndrome and the answer is a little more complicated than just looking at the situation with just a black and white lens. Recall that I just mentioned that synthetic steroids like cortisol are used as an immunosuppressant in autoimmune disorders. Sometimes both the doctor and the patient must weigh the pros and cons of continued steroid use 
even performing cycles on and off the steroid to try to mitigate the effects of high cortisol levels while still managing the destructive nature of the autoimmune disease. Okay, so outside of cortisol and aldosterone, our adrenal cortex is also responsible for release of a group of hormones known as androgens. You can kind of think of these androgens as precursors to sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. While technically our reproductive organs, i.e. the ovaries and the testes, are going to produce the majority of these sex hormones, your adrenal gland can account for a significant portion of the product. For example, with testosterone production, only a fraction comes from the adrenal gland in males, but in females, it can account for as much as 30% of the hormone production of testosterone overall. We will discuss the effects of testosterone and estrogen in detail when we look at our reproductive system. But for now, we just need to understand that they are important for maturation and body development. All right, so we've got aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens. Check, check, check. All of that coming from the adrenal cortex. But what comes from the adrenal medulla? Ah, remember? It was epinephrine and norepinephrine that comes from the adrenal medulla. Perhaps you need a little bit of a refresher. That's okay. Remember that our autonomic nervous system is able to stimulate the adrenal gland to release neurohormones to trigger a quick response to a sudden stressor. Think of this like if you get into a car accident, your adrenal medulla will release epinephrine, essentially adrenaline, into your bloodstream so that your body can react quickly to this stressful response. We discussed the sympathetic nervous system's triggers and effects on various tissues in a previous episode. If you're having trouble recalling all of the glorious details of that conversation, you can check out the description section of this video for a link back to the nervous system. Okay, so let's wrap up this video by finishing out with our kidney. While we already briefly mentioned the roles of renin hormone, the kidney also secretes a hormone called erythropoietin, or EPO for short, and it's responsible for red blood cell production. I should also mention that our liver plays a role in secreting this hormone as well, but the kidney is the primary producer. The last kidney hormone is calcitriol. You may remember this hormone when we discussed calcium homeostasis back in the integumentary system and bone physiology. This hormone results in the body increasing calcium absorption in the small intestines, and as a result, raises blood calcium levels. All right, y'all, so in this video, we got to discuss the adrenal gland and kidney hormone regulation pathways. We will continue to explore these hormones and delve deeper into the kidney later, but collectively, these two structures enable us to regulate blood osmolarity, energy availability, sexual development, fight or flight responses from our sympathetic nervous system, as well as red blood cell production and blood calcium homeostasis. If that coolness is not mind blowing, I am not sure what is. I hope you all have enjoyed exploring these tissues. Be sure to like the video if you found it helpful and subscribe to catch our next video over the pancreas and liver regulating blood glucose concentrations. As always, thank y'all for watching and see y'all next time.